You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Deanna Ramirez, Ben McAdams, Matt Pruitt, and Joel Rogers to talk about how cities can create inventories of existing assets to generate public wealth and how economic value can be harnessed for public good. Stay with us. As a Talking Headways listener, you know that U.S. transportation needs a major overhaul. I want to introduce you to a new podcast that dives deep into this very subject, with many of the voices that you love and trust. The modern American economy was built for cars. Not having access to one can put a person at a serious disadvantage. So what will it take to change the way we move around? Enter Mode Shift, a series that explores the past, present, and future of how we move. Hosted by global policy expert Andre Greenwald and transit entrepreneur Tiffany Chu, they dig into the forces that are holding our transit system back and the forces that could unleash it. Find and follow Mode Shift wherever you find your podcasts. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Thanks for supporting each month. We really appreciate it. To join this merry band of zoning nerds and infrastructure wizards, go to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. $2 a month gets you some stickers and a handwritten note. $10 a month gets you one of our transportation scarves. Heavy knit bus or bike only or lightweight bike only with fading checkerboard design. Sign up at patreon.com slash theoverheadwire, and I'll send one right along. You can also purchase the scarves at theoverheadwire.com. Get your fresh Elmo or fresh Kermit before winter arrives. Order now at theoverheadwire.com. Also, because we do a lot of episodes covering a lot of books, we've partnered with bookshop.org as an affiliate. This means that if you buy a book through the Overhead Wire shop on Bookshop, a small amount of that purchase goes to us. Now, we love when you order from your local bookstores, but if you want to support the authors we have on the show, and help keep us interviewing them, that would be tremendous. All the books we've ever discussed on the show with the authors are now in the shop. That's bookshop.org slash shop slash The Overhead Wire. That's bookshop.org slash shop slash The Overhead Wire. And finally, check out The Overhead Wire daily newsletter, established in 2006. We were doing it way before anyone else thought it was cool. Join thousands of readers and sign up for a two-week trial at theoverheadwire.com to check it out. That's a two-week free trial at theoverheadwire.com. Well, Mayor Ben McAdams, Deanna Ramirez, Matt Pruitt, and Joel Rogers, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Great to be with you. Thank you. Yeah, good to be here, Jeff. Well, thanks, everybody, for being here. Before we get started, I'd like each one of you to tell us a little bit about yourselves. And first, we'll start with Deanna, and then we'll go with Ben, and then Matt, and then Joel. Great. So I'm the Executive Director for the Department of Economic Equity and Opportunity here in Harris County, which is Houston, Texas. It's a department that got started a little over a year ago. And it's supposed to do lots of really interesting progressive work, including economic equity through our economic development, reframing, and then ARPA funding for workforce training programs, small biz technical assistance, and our MWBE program, and then our putting assets to work grant. I'm Ben McAdams. I was a member of the Utah State Senate, went on to be elected as Salt Lake County Mayor representing the Salt Lake metropolitan area. And then I was elected in 2018 to the United States Congress. And now I am back in the private sector. When I lost my election in 2020, you know, I have such a a passion for public service. I said to myself that I wanted to continue to be in a place where I could make a living and still make a difference. So I came back to this idea of putting assets to work, which is something that I was working on when I was mayor. I think it's got such incredible potential to do good in our communities, partnering with people like Deanna Ramirez and helping them to succeed with an initiative that we'll we'll talk more about it. But I think there's such incredible potential here, and I'm excited to be working on this now in a private sector capacity. My name is Matt Pruitt. I'm president of a nonprofit organization called Radical Exchange Foundation. And we do a variety of sort of consulting and research and sort of community building focused on the idea of institutional innovation. So we take a really deep look at the basic institutions of markets and democracy and think about better ways of doing it, better ways of conceiving of property rights, better ways organizing voting systems. And we often apply cutting edge ideas from mechanism design and, and game theory to these problems of reimagining institutions. So yeah, happy to be here. And I'm Joel Rogers. I teach at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I direct a center there called COWS. It's been around for about 30 years, and it has lots of little sub-projects, including a 
the mayor's innovation project and the state smart transportation initiative within the mothership of cows. But cows is basically about promoting high road, being equitable and inclusive and environmentally sustainable and democratically accountable solutions to a variety of problems. We've worked a little bit in housing, but mostly in energy, a lot of stuff in transportation, infrastructure, a lot of stuff in human capital systems, worker training, and a variety of other things. So that's one thing I do. And the other thing I do is I'm the chair of something called the Educational Partnership for Innovations in Communities Network, which is a ridiculously long name to produce the acronym EPIC, EPIC Network. And that's a collection or network of about 65 or 70 universities around the world, a lot in the U.S., uh, some in Africa, some in Asia, some in Latin America and the Caribbean that use the EPIC model of university community engagement, which is a pretty simple model, which we can talk about if we want, but mostly is an incredibly efficient, incredibly cheap and effective way of getting university knowledge out and about and used by communities that want it on terms that they welcome and don't feel oppressed by. Awesome. Well, so I wanted to have you all come on the show to have a bit of a roundtable discussion on the topic of public wealth. And I must admit, I'm a bit nervous about this because it's the first time we've done a show with four folks and it's kind of a new topic outside of my personal knowledge. So go easy on me, please. (laughs) First, let me kind of explain why I pulled together this crew of folks. The reason I wanted to get into this topic today was because there are two articles that actually came out on the subject on the same day that I was doing my daily news search that I do for my newsletter. And Joel and Matt wrote a piece for Noma Magazine about public wealth, and the Kinder Institute for Urban Research at Rice put out a piece about Harris County, where Deanna works. And as Deanna mentioned, Harris County is where Houston is located. And the county is inventorying assets as part of the Putting Assets to Work incubator, which is where Ben's working. The most famous discussion about this is likely from Dag Detter and Stefan Folster's book, The Public Wealth of Cities, but it's a topic that I think has generally been under the radar for a while. So first, I want to start with Ben. Where did you first find out about this idea of public asset inventory, and why was the idea so compelling? So I was connected to this idea through Bruce Katz, who introduced me to Dag Ditter. It was before Public Wealth of Cities was published. In fact, if you look on the dust jacket of Public Wealth of Cities, my claim to fame is I gave one of the endorsements to Dag's book when that came out. But the predecessor of that book was the Public Wealth of Nations. And so I got to know Dag, you know, and as a mayor, I was the mayor of Salt Lake County at the time. And I know how challenging it is to try and find resources to solve some of the issues we were confronting. One of the things that I was working hard on was advancing early childhood education. We know that that, that closing the achievement gap is critical to the success of our residents. It was working on homelessness and addiction and trying to help individuals who were suffering from addiction to get resources to treatment, to become sober and stable. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you, having worked through that, I know that money doesn't solve problems, but you're not going to solve a lot of problems without adequate funding. And so it was always a challenge. And I know that local government, like we didn't have the money to fill our potholes, to do basic, basic core function of government stuff. And so for me to be saying, look, we need to invest more in in addiction and treatment and be uh, investing in early childhood education, people would just say, well, how are you going to pay for that? And so it was around that time that Bruce Katz introduced me to DAG. and, And the concept essentially was that if all you look at is your revenue and expenditures, yeah, it's tight. We don't bring in enough money to pay for the expenditures that we have to pay for. But what government doesn't do is, is look at the balance sheet. You know, in fact, it wasn't until very, very recently that government was even expected to have the concept of a balance sheet. And so DAG's premise was if government were to look at their balance sheet, inventory what you have, quantify the value of that, we were actually sitting on a gold mine of resources. And if you can tap that balance sheet to put it to work, to generate revenue back to the community, it's actually quite a bit of opportunity there. So we put DAG's premise to the test. We did an inventory of all publicly owned, commercially viable real estate assets in Salt Lake County. And what we found was, first of all, there was a lot. And we made some assumptions. We worked with Urban3 to quantify these. They're all out there. You know, they're all in GIS so we can find them and organize them and pull them out. We made some assumptions to figure out what the value of those were in their current state and then what they would be if we put them to work as neighboring parcels or put to work by private owners. 
And what we found was that we were sitting on a portfolio of commercially viable real estate assets valued at roughly $45 billion. My budget when I was mayor was $1.1 billion. So we had a 45x of real estate assets that we were sitting on. And you know, you don't have to think too hard to say, let's say we just take a handful of those. Let's take three, you know, a parking lot that is underutilized, a library that, you know, was built 60 years ago in the middle of nowhere and is now in a densified transit-oriented part of downtown. And we could put those to a different type of use and generate revenue off of those assets. And those that revenue, you know, maybe those three parcels, that could generate a million dollars a year that goes in to fund an early childhood program, to fund vouchers for treatment or access to affordable housing. And indeed, there is a lot of potential there. We saw that in Salt Lake County. And what we're doing now, we'll talk about it later, but with the Putting Assets to Work Incubator that I, I helped to found, we are working with communities across the country to evaluate their assets. What balance sheet do they have? What we're finding with all of them is they have resources. They have assets that they're sitting on. We're working with them to come up with a structure to help unlock and tap into those resources to have funding so that people like Deanna and have the resources to put it into the equity initiatives, the social impact initiatives that can really turn communities around. And Deanna, you're working on this for Harris County, and I'm wondering what the impetus was for you to apply and why Harris County is a perfect match for this idea of inventorying assets and finding the public wealth in the county. Yeah, we got really excited about the program. The incubator is the grant partnership between Sorensen Institute and then the Government Finance Officers Association. And I've been a member of the GFOA for, you know, over a decade. You know, I like the work that they do. And so when I saw this work, it was something that I was doing in a less sophisticated way. My previous job, I was at Travis County, which is Austin. Um, I was in their planning and budget office. And part of my work was in space planning for the county. And we identified a bunch of underutilized parcels that, you know, we've been working on trying to figure out how to better use them for community benefits or creation of revenue streams for the county. And we had a very limited number of parcels, but we still had some that we could use. So when I moved over here, I saw that no one was doing that work. And I saw the grant application come through through an organization I'm a member of. I was like, oh, my gosh, I really want to do this. I was super excited that we were actually selected because the city of Austin had applied also and Austin always gets everything. (laughs) Um, And I was like, no, you know, they're going to beat us out. But I was so excited that that we were able to, to get the grant. And, you know, in just looking at our GIS mapping system, you know, just a quick look, I saw that there were 345 parcels just owned by Harris County that were titled as building or vacant. (laughs) And the vacant, I'm assuming, were parking lots and things like that. But 345 parcels, those are a lot of parcels that we could do something with. The other area that I was very concerned about, the reason that I wanted to do this is that as the new flood maps come out, you know, Harris County is all floodplain. We have like 34 bayous running through Harris County. What's that going to do to land available for development? right? How are we going to handle that? And we're already seeing increases in home prices, and we're already seeing a lot of displacement anytime that we're trying to improve infrastructure in certain areas. So let's use the assets that we have already to try to right some of those inequities and be a little more progressive in how we handle the attraction of development without displacing historic communities. Yeah, that's really important. And as somebody who was born in Houston and actually in Humble and went to school in Austin, I understand your sentiments <laughs> about what's going on in both places. Well, Matt and Joel, you all have outlined a system for cities and counties to inventory their wealth and manage it better. Your system is really compelling. The idea that number one, asset wealth in cities is undervalued and undermanaged. Two, unlock with a Henry George style land tax. Three, limit speculation, which I think Deanna was discussing as well. And four, apply to these urban wealth funds. So my question to you all is, how do you think that we got here initially? And why do cities not know or understand the wealth that they have? Well, I mean, why don't people understand the wealth? Because you have an entire culture and system dedicated to obscuring obvious facts. Care to expand? (laughs) Well, I mean, the last 50 years, and we can go back further, but certainly the last 50 years have been one of 
you know, what's commonly called neoliberalism, sort of the idea that private markets pursued by quite predatory guardians within finance are the way to generate social prosperity. And I actually like markets. Markets are fine, but markets are very, very useful tools in the wrong hands, in predatory hands, can really mess up a society in a, in a big time way. Now, this society has record levels of inequality now, both in wealth and in income. There are a lot of people who've been abused within the society and obviously getting sort of tired of it and have been able to articulate that fatigue and, and that rage and that hurt, I think, more effectively in the last 50 years than, than in the previous several hundred in the U.S. So you have a combination of a society that is manufacturing unbelievable amounts of scarcity when it could be enjoying unbelievable abundance. And you've got a series of power structures that are pretty clearly illegitimate. I mean, let's go with Martin Luther King, right? Power without love is reckless and abusive, but love without power is sentimental and anemic. To look at the assets you have that are putatively under your control in an allegedly democratic system that is operating very, very far from democratic accountability is a great way to start a very hopeful discussion. But doesn't surprise me at all that that's not a public discussion that we've had before DAG's work and, and other related work. I mean, there's a lot of interest in the revival of Henry George. I teach at a university. And kids are just now discovering, you know, Henry George for the first time. You know, go figure that. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the biggest reasons we've gotten into this situation of public authorities, you know, sort of not managing these public assets optimally in the public interest is really just kind of a lack of creativity. And one of the reasons I think we've gotten here is we've become trapped in a sort of a false dichotomy between public and private. So, you know, on one side of the spectrum, we have the idea that, you know, public authorities should technocratically make all the decisions that they can to manage assets in the public interest, which often, frankly, exceeds their capacity, right? I mean, governments are collections of people that often, you know, don't have the bandwidth to make the perfect decision about what to do with every single asset that is under their management. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have privatization, which is like, you know, the pendulum swings all the way to like assigning public property to private interests and managing it for maximum profit extraction. Cities don't want to be in the position of, you know, entering into an adversarial landlord tenant relationship with the people in their city. So there's like a vast unexplored territory between these two poles that I think we've simply lacked the creativity and experimental will to explore. And, you know, Henry George is one thinker from the past who's, whose ideas kind of gesture towards that middle ground. And there's a lot of other interesting ideas that have been developed in recent decades about how to do that as well. I want to kind of go to a comment that you made about privatization. So I want to kind of ask the group, you know, what's the difference between a public wealth fund and this idea of privatization? Because I think there's a lot of ways that they can get confused if allowed to. I think it was a very different thing. A public wealth fund is a way of saying, okay, what is currently under the public ownership and how can we use that better to benefit the, the public? Part of that is generating the revenues that, that Ben was talking about, but there are other ways in which you want to use those funds. Privatization is taking some public good or public service and eviscerating its structures of public accountability and handing it over to private for-profit providers to substitute for that which used to be provided by the government. To go back to something Matt was saying, I mean, a big thing is hanging over the conversation in cities and in government in general in the U.S. is that uh, you've had a tremendous decline in confidence We've never been real confident in government in the U.S., but I think the level of confidence in government being able to even do things correctly has reached something like a nadir 
in large parts of American politics. So the idea that, well, you want the public, people then say public equals government, Matt's point, it does not equal government necessarily, it means the public. Public wealth fund, my goodness, that means a government operated thing and it's gonna be subject to the same sort of corruption and rent seeking and and ridiculous short-sightedness, and, but above all, incompetence that people usually associate with government. But public wealth funds and privatization, maybe they're confused in some people's heads. I think of them as almost polar opposites. One is taking a public asset, maybe a not well-managed one, and just giving it over to private for-profit entities. The other is taking underutilized public assets and using them for the public good, using markets and using possible revenue generating facilities as part of it, but but it's very much controlled by public purpose rather than a private purpose. I'll jump in there too. First of all, let me say, Joel, I actually, when I was a mayor, went to the Mayor's Innovation Project a couple of times. Fantastic work. Always came away with big ideas and and fueled a lot of the creativity in government. So thank you for your work there. I think you hit on some things, and I want to bring it back to what Matt said too, about rejecting the notion that there are two poles and it is either public or private, because that sets up a false dichotomy. And I think it's one where it's adversarial and zero sum. Right, that the in order to, for the private sector to do well, the public sector has to do less well, and um, I think that there's a way to approach these that isn't adversarial, but you're somewhere in the middle. So first, I want to go back to the notion. So these are oftentimes called urban wealth funds, playing off of the notion of sovereign wealth funds, right? So it's a maybe a, a municipal equivalent of a sovereign wealth fund, but that is not a privatization. That is saying we have public assets. And we are going to manage those public assets in a way that is is professionally managed with the expectation that it generates a return. And, you know, akin to, I think you could look at how public pension funds are managed, right? So you have retirement funds that are put into a, a pension fund. You have employees who make investment decisions over those funds, but they manage them for the public benefit. So that's kind of what this is about. I resist from using, I'll just tell you, I resist using the words urban wealth fund for some of the reasons that Joel mentioned, but I am, uh, my political career, I've been a a Democrat in, in one of the most conservative states in the country. So I'm always sensitive to the terminology that we use. And urban seems to put people on their heels a little bit, especially when you're talking in suburban and rural areas. Wealth, nobody likes to think of their government being wealthy. And then fund is a word that the Democrats hate to even think of fund. So I I, I don't know what the better term is. That's why we are calling our incubator putting assets to work that is just plain vanilla descriptive right now until we land on a, on a different word, I think, that doesn't have people on their heels. But when I think about what we're doing with this, it's getting away from that dichotomy of if the private sector wins, government loses, or look, there. I think there are things that government does well and things that government doesn't do well. And there are things that the private sector does well, as long as you've got guardrails and incentives and accountability over private sector, there's something about that hunger that 24 seven hunger to get every last drop out of an opportunity that I think we can tap into for the benefit of government, for benefit of communities that uh, where you align those interests, where um, you're bringing in some of that professional management that exists in the private sector without selling off and privatizing assets. Keep them under public ownership, keep them working for the public benefit, but you tap into some private sector partnerships that aren't adversarial, but are more aligned to help you do that. Now, Deanna, is this something that Harris County might think about doing is creating a... um putting the assets to work. I'm trying to be nice with the language now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I I think at local government level, even every little grant that you apply for has to get your governing board's approval. So it did get approved by the Harris County Commissioner's Court. Um, Our county administrator is excited about the idea. Um, And in Texas, our legislature is, you know, every two years they're in session and, and they're always looking for ways to box in local governments so they can't raise taxes. So, you know, they're more limited. We have, you know, revenue caps right now in place. So, you know, the more we're limited in Texas County's main source of funding is property tax, right? We don't have sales tax. That's the cities and special districts. So we just don't have that much to rely on. So, the idea that we could actually use our assets to create some revenue that's non-property tax revenue is very appealing on the financial side. And then on the equity side, 
the idea that, you know, we can actually use these assets in partnership with the community that surrounds that particular asset to make sure that we're doing something there that the community that's already there wants to see in their neighborhood, in their area, I think is a really good way to to think about it. In Travis County, we did something like that for a parcel that we had, call it our North Campus area. And we have a couple of parcels that we owned and then a corner parcel that we didn't know what we were going to do with it. We bought it. It was an old gas station, cleared all the underground storage tanks, that kind of thing. But we wound up being able to, to do a very kind of complex deal where the front part of the project became our health and human services flagship building. The back part was a parking garage that was wrapped with low-income housing tax credit affordable housing units. Um, So we wound up with, I think, 242 um, 9% units. We were able to work with the neighborhood associations all around that parcel and made sure that they were all happy with it too. We got their input. We have a bunch of meeting rooms built in. It took a long time. It took a lot of effort. We had to hire a bunch of different kinds of experts, but it's in place. And in an area like like that, where you have the Austin Metro Red Line, you have a lot of bus transit in that area. It's a gentrifying area. It's a growing area. It's wonderful. And, you know, it was the first time we'd ever done something like that. And we used, we cobbled together so many different kinds of authorities and laws to be able to get it done but it worked. And I think that that's the same thing that we can do in Harris County. And my idea is that once we get the asset map from this project and we see the values, I want to pick low-hanging fruit. I want to pick our proof of concept. I want something that everybody can see the value of and that that's what we go with. And then we build out a bigger portfolio of what we can really do. Once we show that proof of concept, then I think we can go much deeper and harder with the whole project to make sure that we can get not only a revenue stream in some instances, but in other instances, we might not get as much revenue, but we're going to get the community benefits there. Whether it's that we're having the construction contractors have to have apprenticeships and and use union labor and have living wages, or whether it's that, you know, you're setting up open space and green space for the neighborhood use because they don't have that there, or you're building affordable housing units there, or some kind of below market rate, small commercial areas for minority and micro businesses. I mean, I think that those are the kinds of things that we can balance and come up with a, a different look for each project based on the needs in that area. And that's what really excites me, that we can make it very place-based. It's really exciting that you can actually, you know, pull together these resources and kind of learn what's on the ground, because it seems like, at least from reading the Kinder article, from reading a bit of Dag Detter, from reading Matt and Joel's work, it seems like there's a lot of places that I could actually do these inventories and find out that they're massively under-resourced in terms of like understanding what they actually are sitting on top of. Ben, the process for creating an inventory seems very straightforward, fairly straightforward anyways, and not too expensive. It seems like a lot of places aren't doing it though. Is there a specific reason why you found that they're not doing it? Or is it just they don't know that they can do it? I think first of all, people just don't know where to start. And what we found, what I found when I was mayor is it actually is surprisingly simple. A lot of this stuff because of GIS and technology, these parcel, the portfolio is so big that people just don't know even where to start, but it's all there. And so it's a matter, you know, I mentioned that we've been working with Urban 3 and um, they'll pull them out. They'll put them on a geospatial map. You can see them, you know, red dots are public parcels. We go through it. We're working with people like Deanna right now in Harris County through our putting assets to work incubator. And we're mapping these geospatially. Then you'll look at it like in Salt Lake County. What we looked at is we found that you know, big portions of publicly owned parcels are watershed and backcountry, and we don't want to touch those. So we take those off the map, but you you look at the ones that you don't want to touch, and you're left with some that are underutilized parking lots or buildings that really could, could generate more opportunity. And that's uh, that's an exercise, but it's not a, you know, it's probably a three to four month exercise. I think, you know, roughly seventy five dollars to $100,000, depending on how big your jurisdiction is, is what this process would cost. So it's it's not insurmountable. And what happens then is people see, as, as Deanna is mentioning, you see some real low-hanging fruit and you say, we've got a world of opportunity. We're going to start with these two or three opportunities and it's going to be the fuel 
that funds an equity initiative or an environmental initiative or early childhood initiative. And it, it's really getting from not knowing at all what you have to seeing what the world looks like, but it's big and it's intimidating to think about biting off a $45 billion portfolio to then saying, okay, we're not gonna bite off a $45 billion portfolio. We're gonna take three parcels and those three parcels are gonna do something that's impactful and meaningful in the community and the community can see what would happen without raising taxes. Yeah, g- given the GIS stuff is available everywhere, a lot of this stuff is, or virtually all of it we found is available through public sources. You know, I've got an undergraduate now who's doing these maps. You know, we're working with Minicozzi and Taylor and the other folks at Urban 3, the firm. That, but we're basically just doing it with student labor now. We're doing it for, I think, 35 or 40 of the mayor innovation project uh, cities right now. And, you know, it's it's a little bit of work. They'll say it's a lot of work. But you're just talking about a couple different people giving at least a skeletal picture for these cities. And then you go back and say, oh, no, I, exactly what Ben said. You know, we don't want to take some park and turn it into, um, you know, condos or something. We want to preserve the genuinely public purposes that are fine right now. But it's very easy to find these data. It's amazing, though how few cities have decent reporting in a way that someone outside that city can easily access. We're trying to get do a value per acre analysis of all these cities. And you'd be amazed at the number of cities that don't know how much they're getting on a parcel basis in a way that someone outside that city can grab a data file from. And some of the data is a little wonky. It's not quite the same between counties. I know that when I used to work on TOD databases, you know, at my old job, basically, you know, you'd look at, let's say, uh, St. Paul and Minneapolis, Ramsey County and Hennepin County. And when you looked at the green line that goes between the two of them, the parcels didn't match up because their systems for reporting them were so wonky, you know, as opposed to each other. So it's kind of hard to do in some, some instances because of that. You know, I think it's probably gotten easier since I was doing it. But at the same time, you know, it'd be nice if, if cities could put together kind of a way for their parcel databases to tell you this information that seems like low-hanging fruit, like you all mentioned. Yeah, everything's gotten easier since you did it. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you my age. And, you know, and what I would just encourage people to do is to just get that data, put it out there. This is an iterative process, but if you see what the potential is, it, it begs the question of how can we, where do we start? Right. And that's the key is just getting to the point where you have a leader like Diana in a city who has an initiative that she doesn't know how she's going to fund it. And then she sees this low hanging fruit there where they can do it. I know, you know, you think I was a mayor with a, a billion dollar budget, which is probably pennies for Diana, but in, in Harris County, but you'd think that with a billion dollars, there's just like cash lying everywhere that I can use and put it into any any initiative they wanted. But the reality is, is every penny is programmed. And if I wanted to pull $100,000 for a trail, what was I cutting or who was I raising fees or taxes on in order to do that? And um, to have these opportunities here, there's there are things that our local governments need to invest in core functions of our communities and supporting our communities. And there just aren't the resources to do that. And yet we're sitting on this gold mine of opportunity and it's really not that complicated or expensive to just uncork it and get these opportunities flowing to the people who can then deploy them in a way that that lifts our communities. And I think also, you know, in local governments, lots of times the folks that are in charge of the real estate are really separated from the programmatic folks who are looking for ongoing resources. You know, so we got this grant application submitted in the spring and then got it awarded um, like around May or so. And right at a commissioner's court meeting, right after our grant contract was approved, they had an item where they were where our real estate folks were putting a parcel up for sale, right? And I was like, oh man, we're selling a parcel already? Come on. And it's right, you know, off of the 610 loop, for those of you who know, Houston area. And it was a building that we had a department that grew it. So they moved them to another building, another facility they had bought. And so now they were selling this. I'm like, well, it is going to be a really good 
you know, example for us to show, I've been watching it to see how much they're going to get for this, right? How much are we going to sell this for? And then I want to see, because it's in, it's still listed as a parcel that Harris County owns, what's going to be the value of it, you know, based on this grant and the assessment that happens there by Urban 3. So I'm really interested to see how that's going to show the difference. And I, I would bet that we're not going to get any amount close in selling it than what you know, we'll see it if we had redeveloped it and kept it. So I, I think that there's just such a disconnect in, in local government and people are just busy doing their own little work in their own little silo and they're not thinking bigger picture. I think that's a really good point. And especially since, you know, you can sell something for a capital and you get a one-time infusion of money or you can keep it and have a long-term stream of income. And I think that there's an, it needs to be an understanding about what that means for the, the fiscal, you know, sustainability of cities. And Matt, that kind of goes to your and Joel's land license idea. Can you explain that a little bit in, in terms of what you think that, you know, you could do by changing the way that we look at like assets in these ways? Sure. It's a great transition because I think it's really important to see as a preliminary here that in most ways, you know, even if the public authority is able to get a good price for, you know, selling land or real estate, it's really not in the long term public interest to do that. There's there's always going to be a better way of serving the public interest than like sort of fully disposing of land into the private market and allowing a, a private owner to maximize profit from it. You know, but then on the other end of the spectrum is sometimes difficult and beyond the capacity of a city to manage property as a landowner. So in between these two options, there's a really interesting unexplored territory of new forms of licensing, basically, that cities can use and explore to ensure that public interests are really well represented, but also ensure that the sort of private sector logic is brought to bear to a certain degree in thinking about how to optimize the uh, the use of the land. So to quickly sort of summarize this kind of innovative licensing that I have in mind here, you might imagine sort of periodic licenses, sort of like terms of occupancy for a piece of land being like re-auctioned every year or so. So imagine, imagine if like you take a piece of land and every year or so, a special license that land is put up for auction the winner of the auction is able to basically act like the private owner of that land, but only for a year, right? Then it goes up for auction again. And during the course of that year, the winner of the license auction pays a a fee to the public, to the city, that's calculated as like a percentage of their winning bid for the license. And then one more really important feature of this this license design is that at the end of the period, when the license is re-auctioned, when it's put back up for auction, the winning bid is paid not to the city, but to the prior owner of the license. So what, what this is, this is like a very interesting sort of hybrid of rental interest and ownership interest held by the possessor of the license. And if you increase the fee that the license holder has to pay during the period that they own it, it starts to look more like a rental interest. And if you decrease the fee, that the license holder has to pay, then it starts to look more like an ownership interest. What this allows you to do basically is to get entrepreneurs to sort of put their collective intelligence to work on how best to use land and space, but also to ensure that the sort of movement in the price over time is resulting in a higher stream of payments to the public. So if the land goes up in value over the course of several years, that upside is in a very, very meaningful way shared with the public and not fully privately captured. So you can sort of think of the system as like a like a dial that you can turn between having a fully private interest on one hand and a rental-like interest on the other. And by exploring this dial, by exploring licenses that are sort of set at different places on this dial, you can give another tool in the tool belt to cities that are trying to put assets to work by allowing them to where appropriate, allow more private logic to be brought to bear, and where that's not appropriate, it's essentially exerting more public control over the land. There are a couple of things that, that always come up in this discussion, which I'm sure no one really understood perfectly in terms of you know all the different licenses and, and the auctions and other stuff. But, but basically, 
the thing that Matt's describing and we try to describe very briefly in this article gets you tremendous greater accountability, which should interest people like, well, uh, like everyone on this call or anyone listening to this now, because instead of just sitting on land and waiting for its value to go up and, you know, encouraging speculation in land, the license thing and the fact that you have to put it up for auction on some regular basis. One thing always is how long is the license good for? Is it a year? Is it two years? Six months? How often do these auctions come up? But the auction stuff, it was a brilliant idea uh, that started trying to root out corruption in you know, a prominent South American country where you had all these owners that were not paying their taxes at all. And the thought was, well, at least get them to declare some values of different assets they had, in which case you would just take them away or be able to buy them if they emphasize it too low. You know, that sort of a, of a tax on things is a, a great way to get people to be clear about what value that they actually attach to different properties. I just want to emphasize the accountability stuff and the increase in accountability of whoever has the license is one great feature of the thing that we're pushing for in the, in the NOMA art. And my understanding is basically public land, and you have this license system for each parcel in the public land, and then you have this auction where you can auction off basically the rights for it for a year. And then what you can do, if once you get the, the money back from the sales, you can actually use that to buy more parcels or buy more land, and then eventually bring a system that's more like a Georgist system through a, a whole city rather than a parcel by parcel system overall. Well, yeah, that's part of the whole. And the licenses, the city would get some r direct revenue from the licenses, you know, because that is a source of revenue for the city. The license itself, whoever has it in, in a quasi public slash private system, the important point is the one that Matt emphasized that at the end of your license period, let's say you lose the auction, you will get whatever was the winning bid for that license. The previous owner gets that bid. So it's not like you put your, I don't know, your house or your property or your building or whatever up for auction every couple of years. And if you lose the auction, you lose everything. No, but you'll get back what the market says the value of that property is at that point. You just won't be able to lie about it. <laughs> to give a little bit of flavor of what this would feel like, it's important to see that the price for a license for a piece of property in this system would be much lower than the actual like value of owning that land. So if you imagine like a million dollar parcel, you know, buying the license to it for one year or two years would cost much less than a million dollars. That might cost $300,000 or something like that. But if the land appreciated, then the value of your license would go up correspondingly. So if you get a 50% appreciation in the land, then you're the $300,000 that you paid for a license, at the end of your license period, if you don't win the auction again, you're going to get paid $450,000 to give your license to the next steward of that land, basically. So it's like a, it's a sort of like an ongoing stewardship system that will, that allows sort of private entrepreneurs to think about how best to use the land, but ensures like an ongoing proportional stream of payments to the public corresponding to the fluctuations in the value of that land. And that you know, reflects a really, really important insight, which is that, that the value of land in cities is created primarily by the network of people living in the city, their economic exchanges, their cultural activity, the fact that they're living their lives and, and doing interesting things around every particular parcel is what makes parcels so valuable. And this is a way of of ensuring that that upside of real estate is not entirely held by private interests. And predatory speculators. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say, what, what an interesting approach. And, you know, far too often I've seen the exact opposite happening in government. Going back to Matt's concept of the two poles of public versus private, what I see oftentimes government does is we will sell a parcel and then we will come in because we care. We're, we're not like a typical landowner. We don't sell and leave. 
we sell, but we care about the community. We want to see the community improve. So we'll sell a parcel and then we'll put a transit stop next to the parcel and a trail next to the parcel and we'll upzone the parcel and we'll improve fire service to the area. And also that parcel that we sold for $5 million is now worth $10 million because of all the community benefit we put into it. But the community doesn't receive the upside from all the work that we've done. And so the, what I think is key in this work is you don't just fire sale a parcel to patch a budget hole today. You know, you fire sell it, you fill some potholes. Um, but you actually, if, if we know that the community come hell or high water is going to be invested in, in making the community a better place, then capture some of that upside and return it to the residents who are making that upside happen. Yeah, you want to retain the public ownership, the underlying you know, fee that you want to increase. This goes back to what you were saying, Jeff. You want to increase that over time, ideally. This will sound very communistic, but you know that's okay. Eventually, I'd like all the land within the city to be publicly owned in this sense, but I, I definitely want to get the dynamism of the market activity, and that's, that's where the license stuff comes in. I've never heard of this and I'm kind of like, whoa, it's blowing my mind. So, <laughs> you know, is, is this, are there examples where this is being tried? I'm just, I'm curious. Yeah. So there are some really interesting historical examples, like, so basically tax structures that strongly resemble this system were really, really popular in German cities pre-World War I. It's like one of the, one of the best sort of historical data sets for this type of system. Oddly enough, and in the, you know, for reasons that are, you know, far too abstruse to get into this, these, this interesting system of land possession was like scrapped in the, you know, turmoil of World War One. Systems that are very similar to this have been used in Taiwan and Estonia at various points in the, in the 20th century. And another important sort of precedent here is, you know, more conventional land value taxes inspired by Henry George which aren't exactly this kind of auction-based licensing system, but they fundamentally have the same kind of economic logic, have been used for much of the 20th century in um, a number of cities, particularly in Pennsylvania. A lot of cities had land value taxes throughout the 20th century. When this kind of thing has been faithfully implemented, the results have been good. It's an idea that, you know, for, for obvious reasons, just listening to me over the past few minutes here, you can see that it's a little hard to wrap your mind around, a little hard to sort of fire people up about and get excited about, but it has you know worked really, really well wherever it's been really tried in good faith over the past century plus, and it's time to roll it out more. Well, Ben, what's next on the agenda for the incubator? Well, so we are working with the communities right now to map their assets and help them to understand what opportunities they have. Inevitably, that'll show an incredibly large opportunity pool. And then I think, you know, as Deanna said, the next step is probably to identify some, some low-hanging fruit, some easy implementable opportunities, the, the vacant parking lot, the underutilized or vacant building that we can turn around, and to marry that to a key community need. And to that, we're going to look to leaders in the city who say a top priority in the city right now is, you know, affordable housing, or one of our incubator cities is looking at climate resilient infrastructure, or um, equity and, and inclusive initiatives. And so we'll look at them to say, look, okay, we can take some of these opportunities, generate some, some revenue, or, or maybe building housing units or other things on site that can help to solve that problem. And we want to just show some proof of concept, how this is working, that it is possible to activate these unused assets and put them to work to benefit the community. So right now we're finishing the asset maps. Next step is to propose a structure for how to move this forward. What what tools can the communities use to do that? And, uh, and at the end, we'll be delivering to the jurisdiction a playbook and a roadmap for, for taking steps to implement this. And, you know, I would encourage any other local governments that are, are, are intrigued and interested in this idea to please just reach out. We'd be happy to talk to you. There's no, you know, we're not, this isn't something we're going to patent and keep it as a trade secret. We want to have everybody see this work and to unlock the opportunity in their own community. So they can find more about it at the landing page for our incubator, which is gfoa.org slash PAW. It's our Putting Assets to Work Incubator. Or just feel free to email me on my personal email, just benmcadams at gmail.com. And Deanna, what's next for you all? Well, we're working with Urban 3 on the map, and um, we want to have our kind of our roadmap 
that we can get from the grant project and then present it to court, to our commissioner's court and have them take a look at it and give them some ideas on which we think are the low hanging fruit that we want to get started with and propose a project and move forward with a project. We're hoping that that'll happen, you know, next year, early next year. And Joel and Matt, when can we see this licensing system put into practice? (laughs) Well, that's a big question, Jeff. But when the power of love overcomes the love of power, there will be, (laughs) to quote Jimi Hendrix, uh, soon, soon, no no promises. I w- we're very excited about the GFOA experiments, and you're asking about next steps. My next step is to invite Ben and Dion to come to the next Mayor's Innovation Project meeting in January, where we're going to be talking about this, among other things. And we'll be, from cows, unveiling our, they're not as slick as Urban 3, but our very basic asset map done by that undergraduate with a little bit of help from me and a few other people. But cities have to see this stuff and have to have this discussion to to have it come alive. There's been a a real embrace of this kind of licensing system in the world of digital assets and sort of programmable assets. A lot of people in that world who are thinking about how to encode new forms of asset possession and who have that space of experimentation of just being able to, to program things are really, really excited about this way of thinking about sharing power over assets, basically. And so there's a ton of experimentation there, but we're, we're really, really excited to work with any sort of city officials who are trying to put assets to work in the public interest and are you know up to experiment with you know, what is really potentially quite transformative way of balancing the public and private logic. I think it makes a very, very rich environment for this, you know, pretty radical reframing of a bunch of discussions in particularly urban areas. You know, all the aftershocks of, of COVID and remote work and everything on the major you know, commercial uh, real estate prices in lots and lots and lots of cities. They, that still hasn't settled out. And the other is this mountain of new money coming down from Biden Harris. It's too little and it's too, maybe too late, but, but it's a lot more money than these cities have seen in a very long time. And so I think people are looking to think about, uh, okay, let's, let's try to start reinventing our, our cities in, in a more equitable way. We have a little bit more money now from the feds. We have uh, a bunch of commercial landlords that are freaking out. We've got obvious problems on housing. We've got all sorts of concerns around equity and mobility. We've got a climate crisis, and we'd really like to reduce our carbon uh, footprint and reduce our energy costs. It's a very promising time, I think, for innovations of the sort that Matt and I were trying to talk about, that Ben's advanced, that Deanna's trying to you know, move forward in Harris County. It's a great time for mixing things up is all I'm saying. I think that's great. It's a good way to end the show. Joel, Matt, Ben, and Deanna, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Jeff. It was fun. Thank you. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of The Overhead Wire and published first at Streets Blog USA. Thanks to our wonderful Patreon supporters for sponsoring this week's show and Mondays at The Overhead Wire. Find us at patreon.com slash theoverheadwire. And you can sign up for our 16-year-old newsletter at theoverheadwire.com. And you can also listen to our show on your podcatcher of choice, including Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, and Apple Podcasts. And if you can't find it there, you can always find its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. We'll see you next time at Talking Headways. <laughs>